I'm thinking if the cable guy can give me a four hour window, <laughs> the doping people can give me at least two hours. Like, come on, like I'm make it make sense to me, Morgan. Megan McPeak in Washington, DC. What are you reading these days? I'm actually not reading at the moment. I am focused on the people versus the Klan on CNN with uh, Beulah Mae Donald and that story. So that's what I've been focusing on the last few days and, and kind of just educating myself with that. Oh, perfect. Good stuff. Let me uh, see if I can find that on demand. Dave Zirin, also in Washington, D.C., honorary Canadian. What are you reading? Thank you for that. Um, I am reading this book right here. I'm getting ready for the Tokyo Olympics, so I'm trying to just figure out what is going on in Olympic history. This book is called Rome 1960, written by David Marinus, probably the best newspaper writer over the last 40, 50 years, one of the best to have ever done it. And he's also written some remarkable books about sports, including biographies of Vince Lombardi, Roberto Clemente, uh, and, you know, the 1960 Olympics, you know, Rayford Johnson, Wilma Rudolph, Cold War intrigue, terrific stuff. So Rome 1960 by David Marinus. Yes, uh, the Clemente biography is very good. I've read it. Um, and I'm your host of Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. Uh, Morgan Campbell here in Ajax, Ontario. And what am I reading these days? I'm reading uh, The Professional by W.C. Hines, uh, a book about a writer writing a book about writing in a magazine, article about a boxer. Uh, my daughter has helpfully pulled the uh, bookmark out. So this is gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be my fourth time starting the book, my third time finishing it. Um, and it's really relevant to today for uh, uh, a couple of reasons. One is because it, it takes place at like this transitional time uh, in the boxing industry. If you guys haven't got into to W.C. Hines, he would be like the uh, David Marinus of magazine writings, one of the great magazine writers of all times. So, and uh, so it takes place at this time where boxing is is grappling with whether to um, stick with these pay, these club and arena shows where the main source of revenue is ticket sales, or whether to shift to TV. And TV starting to win this war. And some of the managers uh, in this book, the managerial characters, are really are really wrestling with this. And this is you know what we're going through now with cord cutting and boxing moving online, boxing to moving the platforms like Triller Reese, guys like. Uh, Jake Paul and and Ben Askren, um, and so it parallels it parallels a lot of the ways that writing is like fighting. In that writers, when you have a book to do, you go away for a while and you work on this book, and then you come back and you show people what you've been working on, which is very much like the way a boxer goes in a training camp, comes back, shows everyone what he or she has been working on. And the other way that writing is a lot like fighting is that uh, Jake Paul just did 1.5 million pay per views. Uh, he and Ben Askren just made in the high seven figures for this farce of a fight. But like writing, in fighting, you don't get paid necessarily because you're good. You get paid because you're famous. Like Mike Pence gets bigger uh, book advances than Dave and I combined. But is Mike Pence one fifth the writer of either Dave or me? Nope but he's a hell of a lot more famous. So anyway, when you get a chance, uh, read The Professional. It'll tell you a lot about not just boxing, um, not just boxing the sport, the industry where it's been, and give you some clues as to where it's headed. Where we're headed this week is to a few places, uh, back to Tokyo, back to the Olympics, back to what remains of the 100-meter dash with uh, the presumptive favorite now officially ruled out, and also to the soccer pitches um, of Europe where some major upheaval is taking place. Now, I alone could not figure out which of these stories was bigger because I'm a big track and field nerd, but the, 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 the football Super League uh, news just broke over the last 24 hours. So I'm gonna throw it up to Megan McPeak. I asked Megan McPeak to give a, a few minutes of thought to this. Which of those topics is on your mind first and foremost right now, right now Megan? Because that's where we're going. You know what? I'm gonna feel feed into your nerd, your nerdiness and we're gonna go track. Oh, we're going straight to Christian Coleman. Okay, perfect. All right. So for you guys, and this is the beautiful thing about doing this on, on CBC.ca, because they're the Olympic broadcaster, like I don't have to beg to talk about track and field. Like they're actually asking me to talk about track and field where, which is like unusual in the history of, of, of mainstream media anywhere on this side of the Atlantic, right? Where basically you're, they almost tell you in journalism school, hey, only pay attention to track once every four years, but no, we get to do this anytime. So what has happened uh, this week is that Christian Coleman, who is the current fastest man in the world. There is nobody, actually, no, 
Justin Gatlin has a faster personal best, but it's from years ago. Like, there's nobody currently running right now who runs as fast, as consistently as Christian Coleman. He ran 9.76 to win the world title in 2019. No one had cl run close to that time, you know, since the, the days of Pete Usain Bolt, Pete Justin Gatlin. But Christian Coleman's problem is he runs so fast that the drug testers cannot keep up with him. He's missed a string of drug tests. He's adamant that he is a drug-free athlete. And the drug testers even said, we don't even suspect you of being guilty, but when we call for these random tests, like you gotta answer, you gotta be there. So three tests were they called and he never answered. So he missed these three tests, automatic two-year suspension. Uh, he appealed it um, and got it reduced to 18 months. But the upshot of that is, the suspension doesn't end until after the Tokyo game. So what the position we are in now is that the top performer in the kind of highest profile single event in the Olympic games is not performing. And so now we have a wide open field, but it's, it's also a field uh, deprived of some star power. So Dave Zyron, does that uh, affect the attention you would pay or the attention you think fans will or should or might pay uh, to Olympic track and field? Oh, no question about it. I mean, it's such a shame because, you know, the 100 meter runners, they are the rock stars of track and field and by extension, the rock stars of the Olympic Games. You know, to take it back to that Marinus book I was reading in 1960, mm -hmm. uh, it's such an interesting story because uh, Wilma Rudolph and Ray Norton they were the rock stars of those games. They were the people everybody was following around the Olympic Village. And one of the people following them around was this boxer you might have heard of named Cash. <laughs> I mean, yes. so Muhammad Ali was, was in a secondary or even tertiary position compared to the track and field. And maybe that's changed over the decades, sure, but I don't think it's changed that much. I mean, I think, you know, when you're talking about people like Usain Bolt, Justin Gatlin, these are the rock stars of these games. Um, and on the, oh, my goodness. And on the, the women's side is always like like a celebration of, of greatness from from across uh, the hemispheres. Now, the other thing about the 100 meter race is that the 100 meters begets the 200, you know, which mm -hmm. begets the 400, which begets the high hurdles. It has this ripple effect where if you're into the 100, all of a sudden you're paying attention to everything else. Now, you got Justin Gatlin, who's going to be, I believe, 39 <laughs> part of these Olympics. So that might be interesting, but Coleman should have been the rock star of these games. He's the guy who ran the 4.1240. You know, just to show all the yes. football players what real track running is all about. And so to not have him there, what it does is it injures, it bruises the event that by all accounts should be the epicenter of the Olympic experience. Yeah, a couple of things. And remember uh, last month when Megan was asking us whether or not we had seen Hank Aaron play in person. Um, Justin, Justin Gatlin might actually have been there. Um, uh, let me know when you finish that book, uh, Dave, if there's a chapter in it about Justin Gatlin's performance in the 1960 <laughs> Olympics, because that would be interesting to see the way he is held on. He's still running sub 10 seconds. But it is a shame for Christian Coleman, because as a track and field runner, like you don't necessarily you don't make the bulk of your money like out on the circuit running for a place. Oh, I won today, so I got $10,000. I got second, so now I got $7,000. Like you, you make your money in endorsements, but you make your endorsement money and you get the leverage for your endorsement money in world championship years and Olympic years. And so he's gonna miss out on all kinds of chances um, to make all kinds of money. And there's also the fact too that, um, like as a general sport in public, like we judge the seriousness of a doping offense not by the offense itself, but by the sentence the athlete incurs when they break the rule, like no matter how big the rule breaking is. So imagine uh, like what a baseball player, how many drug tests does a baseball player have to fail to get a two year suspension? Like mm. a lot. Baseball player, they get 80, 50, 50, it's either 50 or 80 games the first time. And it sounds like a lot, but it's a fraction of a season. Whereas a, a track and field athlete, you miss some tests. That's two years out of your life, two years of earning potential, especially in the hundred meter dash where usually like the windows of dominance are not that broad. Like you usually have three or four years uh, running your, your fastest, fastest time to do all your damage. Megan McPeak, imagine like what the basketball tournament would be like if, uh, if the United States men's and women's teams got DQ'd because they hadn't filled out the paperwork. Uh, it would be a disappointment for USAB, but 
it would level the playing field and have a lot more parity than what we what we typically see. I know, you know, obviously in the last couple of Olympics, there's been much more parity when it comes to the basketball side. But you take both USAB men's and women's out of contention and parity level actually raises, in my opinion. Uh, but the, it's so interesting to your point, you know, Morgan, is the fact that you get caught in baseball actually using <laughs> no PEDs or things that are on the banned substance list and you get 80 games, 75 games, whatever it may be. You get a fraction of a season, as you mentioned, not a two-year ban. But yet in, in this case, you just simply miss the tests. You don't even, they, they have said that they don't think he's using. So they don't even think he's using yet. They are putting him in such a position of punishment for missing tests that it's more detrimental than an actual baseball player using a performance enhancing drug and testing positive. The test didn't even happen and he's facing a two year ban. Like make that make sense to me. <laughs> make it make sense because if that's the case and he tested positive, what is his ban then? Lifetime, like lifetime well, ban? Like first, what are we talking about? First offense, this is the thing, first offense positive test would have been the same band, would have been two years, right? When you think about too, and this is specific to track and field, like we in the mainstream sports industry, we have this phrase we use, disgraced sprinter. Mm. And the source of the disgrace is always a drug test. Like if, you, um, if you're caught doing something like illegal, illegal, you won't necessarily get the, the, the phrase disgraced sprinter attached to you. But when you talk about Ben Johnson, disgraced sprinter, Marion Jones, disgraced sprinter, and it doesn't exist in any other sport, regardless of the number of drug tests you, you fail. Like when have we ever heard anyone call somebody a disgraced NFL player, right? Besides, I don't know, OJ Simpson or somebody like that. But like, I remember, Dave, you probably remember this was about 15 years ago, Sean Merriman um, led the league in sacks. Uh, had a positive test. He missed four games. And I think he led the league in sacks again. And the story was he led the league in sacks despite missing four games. Whereas in any other sport, or especially in track and field, it wouldn't be despite missing four games. It would be every else, everything he did before then and after then is tainted by the fact that he had this one drug test. But this sticks to track and field in ways that it doesn't stick to other sports, which is great for, uh, which I guess is great for, um, you know, the ethical side of sports and, and, and ensuring that everybody has a level playing field, but it does make me wonder why other sports are not as stringent. Now, in terms of parity, Megan, I like parity in the sense that everyone has the same playing field, but in yes. terms of the Olympics, I want to see the best people. That is it. Like I am all for like, especially in track and field. Um, and I would do this in basketball. Let's look, if, if the U S has an A team and then like a B team that's as good as everybody else's A team, put them in the tournament. And if the and, and if the if the podium says USAA, USA B, I'm with it. And so like track and field, um, I don't want to see three people from every country, right? I want to like in, in the in the 10,000 meters, I want to see the 25 best men, 25 best women. And if 10 are from Ethiopia, 10 are from Kenya, and then like five others sprinkled through other countries, I don't care. And if the whole podium is Ethiopia and the whole podium is Kenya, perfect. Because what I want to see is the best against the best. And putting Christian, Christian Coleman on the sidelines uh, gets in the way of that. You were going to say something, Dave. Well, only that Christian Coleman doesn't seem to be raising too much of a ruckus about this. Like he actually is saying, I'm glad that I was found to be uh, not guilty of actually taking steroids and I'm fine to go 18 months and I would be raising much more of a stink if I hadn't actually been found uh, to have been taking any kind of performance enhancing drugs. And so that just makes me look at the whole thing kind of sideways. Like, is he under some sort of pressure because of the uh, of the, the tradition of the race to actually respond as the gentleman and say, well, I'll just take my 18 months and be fine? Or does he feel like he might have dodged a bigger embarrassment, which was why he didn't go through with the testing in the first place? I mean, there are just a lot of questions here for me that I think still require answers. So I'm just wondering if you give your entire you know plan, say two week window, and they know where you're supposed to be. One, if they're going to show up at your house, why can't they wait, you know, a little bit longer than what they did or call you if they're waiting and you're not there. And then two, just when you think of athletes, especially elite athletes that are preparing for the Olympics, we're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. We never really change our training routine, our lifting routine. So why would they not go to the one place, you know, he's going to be like, I think of my time in college, 
They never showed up when I was in class. They always showed up at practice. Mm -hmm. And then as well too, I'm thinking if the cable guy can give me a four hour <laughs> window, the doping people can give me at least two hours. Like, come on, like I'm make it make sense to me, Morgan. Very good questions, Megan, but all of them speak to the, the, the goal that the drug testers have of making these tests as random as possible. Like the cable people, they give you the four hour window, but we all know they come at the end of the window. So that's not really random. So these guys don't want to give you a three hour window. They want to say, hey, I'm here. You better be here too, because you they don't want to warn you. Because the theory is if they warn you, you can do something to alter the outcome of the test. And so in this case, Christian Coleman was like, why didn't y'all call me? I was right around the corner. I was at the mall. I was getting some food. I was literally right there. You should have just called me and I would have, I would have been there, but the drug tester say, well, if we call you, then that's warning you. And if you want to go get some fake urine or uh, drink something that's going to um, taint your sample and mask the drugs, then that's what you can do. And so <laughs> we're in this situation where uh, Christian Coleman, yeah, and I don't know why they didn't uh, meet him at the track because we've seen that before. We always, you, you see drug tests at the times I've been at track, I've seen drug testers show up. That's what they do. And they just wait for you to finish. And one drug tester told me <laughs> she had a woman, I guess the woman knew she was on something. And so uh, she showed up at the track to test the person. She was a, the athlete was a do athlete. Uh, and she showed up at the track to test the runner and the runner saw the uh, drug tester and just kept running off the track <laughs> and took off. <laughs> but she wound up getting in trouble for, for dodging that drug test. So it is, uh, I mean, again, the upshot is uh, a, 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 an elite competitor, a super elite competitor is out of the field and fans miss out like um, American fans. We don't know if they miss out because they only pay attention to track every, once every four years. So a lot of them might not even know Christian Coleman exists. Half of them think that, uh, you know, Larry Fitzgerald and, and, and Honey Badger Tyran Matthew are actually faster than Christian Coleman just because they don't know. But it is a shame. And we'll talk about the on track ramifications of his absence in, in or out. But for right now, we got to talk footy. Megan said she wanted to let this conversation steep and marinate, right? That's why we had to do track and field first. But what's happening is 12 of the top clubs in European football, I can't think of them all off the top of my head, but Manchester United is one of them. Tottenham Hotspur is another one. Uh, I think Real Madrid, um, Juventus, Man City, Man City. <laughs> a bunch of them have said uh, starting 2023, we're leaving our leagues. We're going to form the Super League. You know why? Because we're the best, not necessarily, but because we have the most money. We're the richest. We're going to form this Super League because we like it. Guaranteed money. We're here. We don't have to worry about uh, relegation, promotion. We're the Super League, and we're going to let the rest of you leagues suffer with our absence because we have the most fans. We have the most money. We're going to do what we want to do. So they've decided to, to create this Super League. Um, and predictably, the reaction has been overwhelmingly negative um, about what is going to happen if these clubs follow through on their letters of intent to form this new league. Um, and it would un like represent a seismic shift in terms of the way they play soccer in Europe. Now, it would, it would create a league that is a lot more like the NFL. Like the NFL doesn't have promotion or relegation like North American sports leagues. You're in the league or you're not in the league, but you're in the league regardless of how well or how poorly you do on the field. Um, but in Europe where a lot of these soccer leagues pride themselves on the fact that it's a meritocracy and someone from a lower division can play their way into an upper division. This is not going over very well at all. Dave, Zyron, what do you make of this move? Well, other than the fact that I'm very excited about the next season of Ted Lasso, I think there's nothing <laughs> good to say about this whatsoever. I mean, this is an abomination is what this is. I mean, for a sport that is so much uh, connected to tradition and this idea that it's a sport that comes from the poor, that comes from the lower classes, that has this underdog spirit where if you're good enough, you can rise up within the ranks. I mean, this is just a slap in the face to all of that and telling all the people that believe in soccer as something or football, as it were, as something that has this century of tradition that bears weight on the current day. I mean, it's just them saying, hey, suck it up. It's the 21st century. This is about making money. This is about commercialization. And whatever you as the fan thinks soccer is, well, the hell with you. And the clubs are trumpeting the fact these were already very wealthy clubs. They're mm -hmm. going to be over, they, they, their expectation is over $400 million straight yes. profit 
by joining this thing. And there, and that has just a lot of people feeling like, okay, I guess it's just about the money. And, you know, I know that we're all very cynical in this sports world. We say, well, of course it's about the money. You know, as Danny DeVito said, everybody loves money. That's why they call it money, you know, so we get that. But I think we could be a little bit sensitive to the fact that people do feel gutted and destroyed by this. I mean, I live in the D.C. area, and when Maryland left the ACC, people freaked out and went to the Big East. So if something is as small as that, imagine if your entire sports world right. just upended during a pandemic, moments notice, little to no time to prepare, it's ridiculous. And one last thing I'll say is that there's a tradition that you don't really have in the United States that you have in European soccer, where if fans don't like something, they protest. Yep. You know, they raise hell, they, they do civil disobedience, they do whatever <laughs> they have to do. And there are a lot of fan clubs that feel like, wow, they've had this plan forever under wraps, and the only reason they're unveiling it now is because of the pandemic, because we can't organize a protest, yes. like of which stuck at otherwise home. would if there wasn't a pandemic. So people just feel like this is evil every which way but Sunday. So we'll see how this works out, because I'm sorry. I know that you're going to have tons of broadcasting rights, but soccer without fan support is just crazy. That's McDonald's without hamburgers. <laughs> what it reminds me of, Dave, and I'm glad you mentioned Maryland uh, leaving the ACC. What it reminds me of is college, U.S. NCAA college conference realignment. This is exactly what it is, where you have uh, traditional rivals, geographical rivals, leagues that are set up according to geography in ways that make sense. Like in all the ways that college sports doesn't make sense, it made sense in these ways. And you had these rivalries. Like when I was growing up, I could watch uh, Oklahoma versus Nebraska. That was great football because they both ran the option. Clock kept running. You'd watch a whole game in two and a half hours and you're on to the rest of your afternoon. Um, but what happens is money supersedes. So again, like North Americans, we're used to seeing this. We're used to this, seeing the Big Ten saying, well, we need more coverage for our TV network. Um, we got to get out of the we got to get out of the immediate Midwest. Nebraska, you're in because you're in the upper Midwest. Um, Maryland, you're in because now we can get on TV sets and DMV. Uh, Rutgers, you're in because we want to get into New York, right? And we've seen this and we've seen schools like Maryland say, yeah, we're in the ACC. And yeah, it's probably better for our students student athletes to play against teams that are geographically close to us. It's, it's easier travel schedule. They can take care of, they can take care of their classes because we care so much about their classes. And they say, actually, no, we are going to join the big 10 so that we can make these flights to Nebraska mid season because, and the school is explicit about this. You got a bigger payout for being in the big 10. You got the big 10 uh, network money. You share the money that, that teams make on bowl games. You share the money that, that big 10 teams make when they win NCAA tournament games. So it's very much like we see in college football. And the, the reaction, the reaction to it is the way Americans would react to stuff like this if North Americans grew up with realizing how little sense our current setup actually makes. Megan McPeak, um, are you about to sign up for a league pass to uh, European Super League footy? Absolutely not. I'm going to roll with the fans. The fans made European soccer. Like to Dave's point, it started for with people who had nothing because soccer, similar to basketball, is the two sports that you can literally play with nothing. You mm -hmm. need a ball and something to toss it into or kick it into as a goal. Like it's very simple. Like you can literally play anywhere on this earth. And to take this and slap your fans in the face is disgraceful. It's embarrassing, especially when you think of the fact that you have players who played for Man City, Manchester United, coming out and saying that this is a disgrace. Your own former players are <laughs> embarrassed by this decision, especially, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I am, Man City is the team that was truly built on the fans and the shoulders of the hardworking blue collar people and citizens in that area. They built it up to what it is now. So why would you take that away from them? I hope that we see protests, even if it is not accepted right now, because the fans should dictate what happens. It's very simple to Dave's point. It's about money to take something from the great Aaron Rodgers, G R E E D period. That's all it is. And it's disgraceful that you would do this in a pandemic when soccer is all these fans have right now. 
Yeah, well, and, and the, the things that stand out to me are, one, a lot of these teams, if you look at the table, like I, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm not a huge uh, footy fan, but some of these teams, if you look at the table, are not at the top of the table like in England right now. So what makes you the Super League? You're not even better than the teams you're playing against right now. So you're just going to go to a different league and say, well, we're super. Well, why are you super? Well, because we have more money. So this is, again, this is the, the, the Jake Paul effect because you're popular. You can market yourself as better. You can market yourself as, as good as. But if your whole thing is that we, we top handful of clubs from each league uh, are going to go join our own league because we're too good for the rest of y'all. When you get to the new league, guess what? Somebody has to live at the bottom. And are you going to like it at the bottom of this new league better than you liked it at the top of the old league? You might, and, and in that case, the $400 million guaranteed annual payout might be worth it to you. And again, it's amazing um, when regular people say, hey, regular folks should have universal basic income. And then uh, the business class types, like the people that make super league type decisions say, we can't do that. It's going to make you people lazy. But when a soccer league comes along and says, hey, look, we're going to guarantee you a universal basic income, $400 million a year, straight to the top line before you sold a ticket, before you sold a jersey, before you sold anything else. They're like, sign me up. I don't want to have to earn it. Just give me the money. We can go out here, uh, slash costs on players, go 0-35 for the season. I still got my $400 million. So I really don't know um, four or five years from now how these teams are really going to like uh like if the grass is really greener over there, if they should have just watered the grass, you know, in the premiership or in, in Syria. Ah, Dave, you're going to say something. No, no, j just I don't think we should look, look at this as a fait accompli. I don't think they were expecting this kind of eruption of no. anger across the press. And in also another thing in Europe is you very much have like a left press and a right press, uh, you know, or newspapers that you buy based on your political affiliation. Right. And they're united that this is growth. <laughs> And that's pretty rare in Europe. So I, I, I think, you know, there, there still are a lot of wrenches that can be thrown into this, I think. In these polarized times, how far off do you have to be to bring the polls exactly. together? <laughs> together, right? Because usually the people who are that far off base still appeal very strongly to one of the polls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's usually the same poll that they appear, appeal to by being off base on, on, on comment says stuff. But both of the polls can look at this decision and say, man, y'all are nuts. So I'm interested to see again what happens. Yeah, if, if they can't talk some of these German and French clubs into this league. And again, once they start playing, how many of the fans, how much support do they bring with them? And again, how many of these teams actually will have preferred being bigger fish in a smaller pond? We'll see, because like the, the other thing always looks so great until you get it. So <laughs> we will see. Um, all right. So needless to say, we all three of us were out. We were unanimous. We are out on uh, the European Super League. Uh, but the time is running down. It's time to play our favorite game, In or Out. There's a bit of a twist this week because we let off by talking about track and field. We're going to start another uh, periodic tradition, is, which is the way too early uh, Olympic prediction and how it's going to work is I'm going to make, well, each week one of us is going to make a, a prediction way too early to make a meaningful prediction, but we're going to do it anyway, realizing that it'll probably be wrong. Um, and then the other two panelists will tell us whether or not they are in or out on that prediction. So I will start because it's bringing in with Morgan Campbell and I will be the one uh, to embarrass myself first. Um, we started the show talking about the men's 100 meters, so we're going to wrap up this section of the show talking about the men's 100 meter. Uh, I'm going to give you guys my way too early predictions on the men's 100 meters uh, in Tokyo. Dave and Megan are going to explain to me whether they're in or out. So here's how my podium looks. Uh, bronze medal, Ronnie Baker from the United States. And a lot of you guys are saying, who's Ronnie Baker? Ronnie Baker was a bronze medalist at World Indoor 2018 behind Christian Coleman and Su Bing Tian. Uh, and Ronnie Coleman is a guy that like, on his best day, uh, is capable of putting it together. Has had some injuries in the last few years, but when he's healthy, he executes, and I think he's due for a breakthrough. Um, silver medal because there's only two spots left, and one of these spots is a great interest to Canadians. Silver medal, Andre de Grasse of Canada. Sorry, and I think Ronnie Coleman, I'm giving you time, too. So I think Ronnie Baker, sorry, Ronnie Coleman is like if you put Ronnie Baker and Christian Coleman together, and he came out with this big bodybuilder, 
Ronnie yeah, Coleman, look him up. <laughs> So I think Ron Baker's going to run 989. I think Andre DeGrasse is going to get second. 983, new Canadian record. Uh, and why do I think Andre DeGrasse is getting second? Well, first I'm going to deal with why I think he's going to set the Canadian record. Is, is, is He has a few years now, um, back to back, where he's healthy. He's clearly building to something. He opened his season this past weekend, ran 9.99 uh, in Gainesville, Florida. Ran second to Uncle Justin Gatlin, who again, look him up, 1960 Olympics. He's been doing this for a while. Um, and DeGrasse, he's he's a lot bigger now. He's got a new coach, uh, Raina Ryder, down in Jacksonville. And, and the thing about Raina, if you work with Raina, Raina's going to get you in the weight room. And with Andre, it shows. He has his new physique. He's got, you know, a turbocharger that he didn't know. He used to be, he was turbocharged before, now he's twin turbo. 983, I think he's going to set a new Canadian record. Um, and I think he's going to run second to Trayvon Brumel, who is a training partner of his down in Jacksonville. Those two kind of hit the scene together. Trayvon Brumell, in an objective sense, is faster than Andre DeGrasse. He ran 984, and, but since that 984, it's been two, three, four years of injury. But um, in the last year or so, he's gotten healthy. He's been, he's, he's been able to work out, work through the injuries, get himself back together, and now he can just make progress. And, uh, you know, he went viral in the springtime, sorry, in the wintertime for his 60 meter dash at the American Track League. And I think he's another guy, when he's healthy, he executes. Like the question isn't whether or not he can execute when the pressure's on. The question is, is he healthy? Has he had a chance to prepare? When he's prepared, he can execute. And when he's at his best, I think he's gonna run 979. And these are my predictions. Bramel 979 for gold, DeGrasse Canadian record 983 for silver, Ronnie Baker 989 uh, for bronze. Dave Zyron, you enter out on that bold prediction. Uh, I'm in down to the 100th of a second times that you have created <laughs> for this. Uh, you know, M Morgan, you, you are the savant when it comes to this stuff. Uh, and so if you're saying down to the one, <laughs> it's actually a smarter bet for me to just roll with whatever it is you're saying than to come up with my own <laughs> explanation for why Justin Gatlin is going to surprise the world and be the, the Tom Brady of track and field. I'm in on this totally. I'm with Dave. Like, I trust your gut on this one. Um, I I can say, though, I would, I wonder if there's maybe like that kind of like the yips for, for Andre de Grasse when it comes to seeing Justin Gatlin uh, at the blocks. <laughs> and maybe that's why he hasn't been able to beat him at the ripe age of 30 to 39. Like, at some point, I think it's mental. If you're a real track and field nerd, you Google like the 2017 World Relays. And Andre de Grasse chased down Justin Gatlin like Justin Gatlin. He made Justin Gatlin look like a high school student. It's it. I want. I like. I don't. Andre de Grasse has never proven himself to be a guy that like gets nervous when 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 stakes are higher when someone else is on the track. But I can't. I I I cannot explain why he has never outrun Justin Gatlin in an open 100 meters. It is yet. strange. It's a new thing. It's a new thing gotta, here. Gotta be. All right, so we'll check back uh, during the Olympics. We'll see how well my predictions stand up. Um, and the thing is, I I do kind of have this knack for, for, for predicting these races to within a hundredth of a second, but that usually is only like after I've watched all the rounds and after I've watched the semifinals, then you ask me right before the final what I think is going to happen, which is very different from asking 93 days in advance. But hey, what are you going to do? Um, in or out, number two, uh, Trevor Lawrence, who is the presumptive number one pick in the NFL draft, should go to Jacksonville. He's a quarterback, went to Clemson, a tremendously successful college player, but he got himself into some hot water. Over this really spicy quote, let me read it to you guys, and you'll see why it's controversial. <clears throat> He's speaking to Sports Illustrated last week. Here's Trevor Lawrence. It's not like I need football for my life to be okay. I want to do it because I want to be the best I can be. I want to maximize my potential. Who wouldn't want to? You kind of waste it if you don't. It's hard to explain because I want people to know that I'm passionate about what I do and it's really important to me, but I don't have this huge chip on my shoulder that everyone's out to get me and I'm trying to prove everybody wrong. I just don't have that. I can't manufacture that. <laughs> I don't want to. And so... NFL people predictably lost their minds when Trevor Lawrence had the nerve to say he does not have a chip on his shoulder. He had the nerve to say his life is fine without football as if, I don't know, Peyton Manning was like living in a gutter somewhere and if he didn't have a football to throw around, he would never have become anything in his life. So are we, Dave Zyron, are you in or out on this being like the biggest non-story in, 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 <laughs> in a draft process that is always full of non-stories? This is the biggest non-story you in or out. 
Oh, well, actually, I'm out on what you just said. I'm in on this being a story, and I'll tell you. Really? Go, tell me. I'm not I'm not in on it being a story because I think, you know, to be a real football player, you got to rah, 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 or whatever. <laughs> right. You know, I'm, I'm not in on that. I'm in on the pure hilarity <laughs> of, of Trevor Lawrence about to be drafted by Urban Meyer because if there's one coach – who probably has that kind of college mentality that you have to be all in and I don't want to hear anything else. And in my day, we did this. I mean, right. it's the Urban Meyer. And so I, I love the thought of Urban Meyer being uncomfortable. I love the <laughs> part. I, I love Urban Meyer realizing that, you know, he's not in Kansas anymore, otherwise known as Columbus, Ohio. And I love Trevor Lawrence bringing that attitude into a locker room or Urban Meyer is going to try to make everybody chew glass and, <laughs> and act like they're 18 years old and he's the almighty coach father. I just saw, I, I love the dynamics that are being laid out. <laughs> <laughs> Urban Meyer is like calling, calling, calling uh, Trevor Lawrence's agent. He's like, listen, I'm concerned. I wanted to draft a paranoid misanthrope and I have <laughs> really. I have really grave concerns that uh, our guy is actually pretty well adjusted. I don't like that. Like only in the NFL is being well adjusted seen as like a detriment and worst case scenario, right? Trevor Lawrence, because he seems to be well adjusted, scares away. Cause what usually happens is teams get scared to draft you and you fall in the draft. So worst case scenario, uh, Trevor Lawrence, um, falls in the draft and winds up going to a better team because who wants to go to Jacksonville? Megan McPeak, are you in or out on this non-story? I am. I'm totally and completely out on this entirety because one, like Jacksonville fans need to worry about bigger things than if Trevor Lawrence is all about football. Like even with him, do you really think you're going to win more than six games? Like, let's be real. Uh, and if I'm a, if I'm a Jaguars fan as well too, and I, you know, was gracious enough to welcome Trevor Lawrence by getting him and his fiance uh, a gift from the registry, I probably want a refund and my money back. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, last one. We're going to stick with football. Uh, earlier this week, Dr. Anthony Fauci sat down with our man, uh, Marshawn Beast Mode Lynch, to talk about vaccines, vaccine hesitancy, why people should get it, why people shouldn't be, should not be scared to get it, and how to uh, increase vaccine uptake um, among African Americans, among Latinos, among under, un, other underserved communities that have been hardest hit uh, by the COVID pandemic. Megan McPeak, are you in or out on more content like this from Beast Mode? A thousand percent in on this. I mean, you take you take out the fact of how like fun loving and like comical uh, beast mode can be when he has these conversations. Because at the end of the day, he's being himself. Like that is, mm -hmm. and he asked like some fantastic questions that I think a lot of people in the black and and brown and other marginalized communities are wondering and he had an opportunity to talk to dr fauci himself and get a direct answer from him so you take the fun out of marshawn lynch and he asked some poignant questions that need to be answered and i thought it was fantastic so i'm 1000 percent all about more of this kind of content from marshawn lynch yeah i love the fact too that marshawn lynch like while he was playing gave like the shortest most terse interviews ever like an entire interview, that's gangster. And that's like his whole quote for the whole interview. <laughs> or I'm just here so I don't get fined. Giving the suppression, he didn't like to talk. And second career, Marshawn Lynch loves to talk. I had an opportunity to interview him uh, a year and a half ago. You know, about, uh, he was in Toronto. He, we were talking about uh, our friends at The Zone. He was there on their behalf. We were talking about NFL running backs getting paid. And he was really adamant that, you know, that position still had value. But he was, he was, eager to explain it to me in ways that he wouldn't have been two or three years before. So I'm all in on, on uh, more Marshawn Lynch because he is also one of these athletes and ex-athletes who does not have to pretend to be interesting. Like he actually mm -hmm. is interesting and engaging. And that makes a huge difference, whether he's interviewing Fauci, uh, maybe the next uh, Megan and Harry interview can be with Beast Mode. Um, I'd be here for it. Dave, <laughs> Siren, you in or out? Well, I'm all in. Uh, Marshawn Lynch is deeply authentic, deeply intelligent, and deeply connected. So I was actually racking my brain to try to think of a better athlete uh, who could deliver this kind of message. And one would be hard-pressed 
uh, to find one. You know, athletes are role models, whether we want them to be or not. And so if an athlete's going to be a role model, we should pay attention to what it is they're in fact modeling. And I just love what Marshawn Lynch is modeling in this case. Marshawn Lynch is who Charles Barkley wishes he was. <laughs> Perfect. If you guys haven't had a chance uh, to watch that interview, go watch it. And, again, and, the, and the, the genius to me of that interview is that Marshawn Lynch is able uh, to, to speak with Anthony Fauci and connect with like a specific audience with people, with uh, African-Americans, with Latinos, again, with communities that are in the United States, especially in segregated, uh, segregated sections of the city that are underserved by things that a lot of white people take for granted and speak to them. But and address vaccine hesitancy without this default reflex to make it seem like Black Americans and Latinos are stupid or too dumb or too backwards to go get this vaccine. Like that's how a lot of these stories are presented. And Marshawn Lynch flipped that on its head and spoke about it like in real human terms about really logical reasons why some people are hesitant. Then in a lot of ways are connected to race, but then again, but like white people don't get saddled with. There are all kinds of white anti-vaxxers, but they don't carry this cultural baggage. And Marshawn Lynch was able to cut through all that crap and get Anthony Fauci to speak to, um, you know, communities that need to hear this message. And it's beautiful stuff. And so that is the end of my favorite 35 plus minutes of every week. Uh, we love Monday mornings around here. Uh, Dave Zyron joined us from Washington, D.C. Dave, tell the people where they can find you. Find me uh, largely on Twitter, at Edge of Sports. Happy to keep the conversation going. Perfect. And Megan Repeak is also in Washington, D.C., but she is from the Hammer, Hamilton, Ontario, and she is doing some, is it play-by-play -play or analysis uh, for CBC's Summer Olympic basketball coverage, Megan? I will be join, joining the great Dan Schulman as an analyst. So I get to, I get to uh, move over a seat and uh, work with one of the goats in the, in the industry. Yes, perfect. And tell the people where they can find you. Um, like Dave, largely on Twitter, at Megan McPeak with an H, the correct way of spelling. <laughs> perfect. And as usual, I've been your host, Morgan Campbell. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, at Morgan P. Campbell. I'm too old for TikTok, but if you find some funny TikToks, send them my way. If you guys have anything you want to see us address on In or Out, uh, hit us up on Twitter. We'll make it work. Use the, uh, bring it in hashtag, and we'll make that happen. If you like what you hear, uh, hit like subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you don't like what you hear, hit dislike, leave a comment. We don't care. All engagements, all engagements matter. We're just trying to feed that algorithm. Um, until next week, this has been Bring It In with Morgan Campbell, and I'm your host, Morgan Campbell.